Welcome Cornerstone Church. My name is Wayne and I'm part of the leadership here at Cornerstone. And it's my privilege to welcome you to Sunday Morning Online. For those of you that are possibly visiting, maybe a friend or a family member has sent you this link, we are really excited that you've chosen to join us. Please feel free to subscribe to our weekly emailer and this YouTube channel so that you don't miss out on any future content. Our contact details will be appearing on screen. For those of you that are listening via audio only options, please visit our website at cornerstonechurch.co.za. It's been so cool to see how we as a community have responded generously to the needs that have arisen as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown. In times like these, the human condition would probably say, let's batten down the hatches, let's consolidate, let's look after numero uno. But uh, we know that we serve a generous God and He is generous towards us. And as His people, we cannot help but be generous. If you call Cornerstone your home, I encourage you, remember your tithes and offerings and continue to be generous during this time. And let's continue to look after the needs of others. Our banking details will appear on screen shortly. Please ensure that you use the correct reference when depositing money into these accounts so that we can allocate the money correctly. It's been a sad week for the Cornerstone family. Amanda, who was diagnosed with cancer just over a year ago, has unfortunately passed away. What can only be described as a real tragedy, I'm reminded of how courageously this young woman lived. During the last year, she had lost her sight. And uh, two weeks ago, I saw a video clip of her dancing and singing at the top of her voice. And these were the words that she was declaring. I live by faith and not by sight. You are the way, the truth and the life. I live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. Here is a little girl who has been hit by the winds and the waves of life, yet her faith was unwavering in her Savior, Jesus Christ. Our condolences go out to Amanda's father, her family, and to Dave and Margie, who were so instrumental in her life over the last few years. Although deeply saddened by this loss, we can only but rejoice as she is now dancing and singing and gazing into the eyes of her Savior, our Lord Jesus. We're going to enter into a time of worship now, but before then, would you join me in a prayer? Father, we acknowledge that we are frail. We acknowledge that we are weak. And Father, in times like these where there is so much panic and despair, we can only cling to you in these moments. And Father, I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be taken off our circumstances, our eyes would be shifted and placed on you. Lord, help us this morning to fix our gaze on you. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts as we listen to your message. Father, I pray that you would renew our minds as we declare your praises. Father, we are so thankful that in the midst of turmoil, we have a Savior who is risen and that we can cling to. We thank you for your word and Father, we pray for your anointing over it this morning. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us worship. Lord, this morning as we turn our hearts and we turn our affection and our eyes upon you, we pray that you would be glorified in our singing and in everything that we do this morning. I love your name, Jesus.
shout it out We're alive, cause you're alive What a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out
Oh 
Thank you to the Musos. We appreciate your hard work and the way in which you coordinate together to make it happen for us. We love the opportunity we have to worship in our homes together as a church. Uh, it really is a privilege to lift up the name of Jesus. So welcome to you, Cornerstone, and to anybody else that's dialed into this broadcast. It's a wonderful privilege to worship together and then as we read the Word of God to worship again. Man, I would just love to speak to you in the flesh. I really would. To be able to look at familiar faces, to be able to drink coffee, pray together. But this is where we're at and God is using this in an amazing way. And so I do believe that as God's word is preached, healing is going to take place. I believe that he'll deliver from whatever is binding, whatever is tormenting you, whatever is you know, causing you sleepless nights or taking your hope away. I'm trusting God uh, that there'll be signs following and that sign will be you delivered, freed from that. God's word brings freedom. And if you're not born again, I'm praying that you would be born again. And the, the most important thing that we can do is make a decision to serve Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so I'm praying for those signs following. And so I encourage you as well to open up your heart let God speak to you. Let God challenge you. Uh, let God build something of his kingdom in our lives so that we can grow uh, in, in our understanding of this kingdom and we can see this kingdom kind of invade every aspect of our lives. I want his kingdom to come. I want his will to be done. In my life, in your life as well. So we're going to continue with the book of Joel. I'm blown away at how relevant and how challenging this book has been. You know, God by His Spirit has slowed us down as we starting to work through chapter 2. And phrase by phrase and bit by bit, God is speaking to us. God is challenging us. And God is building in us a kingdom resilience. He's building a foundation into us that cannot be shaken. And so I thank God for that. Already we've seen in chapter 2. Um, Joel talk about the day of the Lord with the locusts having come and then that there's another day that's coming when an invading army is going to come and then at the end of the age before Christ comes there's going to be another great day of the Lord and to all of these uh, judgments that are coming Joel says pray the response that we need is to cry out to God in prayer doesn't matter what our situation is doesn't matter what we're confronted with even if it's due to my sin or my disobedience or my rebellion, the thing we need to do, no matter what we're faced with, is turn to God in prayer. And that's what Joel says, is pray. He says, blow the trumpet. In other words, this is a time for the nation to gather and to cry out to their God, to pray to God, to trust God for breakthrough. And it, he says, stop whatever you're doing and pray. And he says to the leaders, lead with this because it's important that we take these issues to God in prayer. So the encouragement for, from last week for, me and, uh, for you and for me is we need to take these issues to God in prayer. If, if it's a challenge, take it to God in prayer. If it's 
a cause for joy, take it to God in prayer and thank Him for what He's doing. And so we're going to look at verses 18 to 32 over the next couple of weeks. Today we're going to look at the issue of God answers prayer. Verses 18 and the first part of verse 19. This is how it goes. Then the Lord became jealous or zealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said, dot, dot, dot. We're going to look at what God said next week. But now we're focusing on the fact is that God isn't like these idols they were serving. He speaks. He hears. He understands. He's got a heart. Not like those idols. And then he answers prayer. He answers prayer. You can pray forever to an idol. You can burn incense. You can do whatever. You can cut yourself. You can do all kinds of things. But that idol is not going to speak to you. And so at that same time, other prophets record this. Israel, how can you serve these idols? They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. And they have mouths, but they can't speak. They are dumb. And one of the prophets says, and you become like them. You become exactly the same. Like stone or wood or metal. Inanimate, unable to respond at all. But God says... I became jealous for this land and I had pity on this people. That's compassion. And so he's responding to them. They praying and he's responding. He, he's, he's seen their plight. He's hearing their cries and their pleas for help. And he's speaking out and answering them and saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to restore things. Whatever the locusts have eaten, I'm going to restore uh, whatever has happened, I'm going to reverse all of that and I'm going to bring you back into a place of blessing. God loves us, not like those idols. And then God says, I'm going to speak to you. He answers. He answers his people. You see, God called the nation to prayer and immediately he answers them. You see, if God calls us to prayer, which he does, we can be assured that God's going to answer that prayer. So God does. God wants us to pray. We'll see. God has called us to pray. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. It's important to note, he taught them how to pray. How to pray. And he kept encouraging them by the example that he set of praying. Always remarking on this fact. I'm only doing the things my father is doing and saying the things my father is saying. In other words, Jesus is praying and he's getting answers from the father. And these are the things that he's busy with. And so in Jeremiah 33 verses 1 to 3, I was taught at Sunday school that this is God's phone number. This is the challenge. The word of God of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the God. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. <clears throat> Excuse me. Call to me and I will answer you. We had to memorize that at Sunday school, and that's God's phone number. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. It's amazing. Jeremiah is in lockdown, and he's challenged to call to God, and God will answer him. You see, it's in those times of introspection when it's important to reach out and to speak to God. Paul is in jail with Silas, and they start to worship. And God answers that worship of that prayer. I want to show you these great hidden things that you haven't known. There's stuff God wants to show us. There's answers that he wants to bring. But he asks us to call to him. And the other side of calling to him is I will answer you. Then in Luke, we have this where Jesus teaches the disciples to pray. Uh, straight after that in verse 5, he says to them, Which of you has a friend? will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. Don't bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. He's saying it's not even on the basis of friendship. 
It's on the basis of impudence. It almost sounds negative, but Jesus is trying to teach us that this is the attitude that we have. We don't give up once we've prayed a thing once. Our prayers don't just dissipate into the ether. They go up to God and they kind of like incense in a bowl on his altar and he is exposed to them. The aroma of those fill his nostril and, and nostrils and he answers those prayers. And, and that kind of word impudence in, in other translations, shameless audacity. In other words, I'm going to stand here and keep my finger on the doorbell until you come downstairs and you get me bread and you give it to me so that I can go and help this friend of mine who's arrived. That's the attitude God wants us to have with prayer. Knowing that as I keep on praying, it will be answered. I keep on. There's another part where he says, don't just babble the same thing over and over again. No, no. Pray. Open your heart. Make your requests known before God. And, and you know, a lot of the times God is also going to deal with something of our heart uh, in the context so that these answers can come. But keep your finger on the bell. Don't take your finger off the doorbell. Keep it there. Actually, put a toothpick in there, one of the preachers said. Uh, keep a toothpick in there and keep it going until it's answered. That's the kind of attitude. You see, Jesus uh, gives that same example in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So this widow goes to a judge wanting some issue sorted out and she cries out to him day and night until he hears. And then it's, Jesus says this, Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So I believe part of that persistence as we pray is having faith in God. It's eventually we're going to start to believe what we pray. Actually, you know what? I'm, that guy's going to come downstairs and open the door. The widow believes that the more she goes and she persists to the point of audacity, shameless audacity, eventually the judge is going to cave in. Now, if the ungodly judge does that, if that friend does that just for bread, how much more will God do that for us? You see, this is the will of God. It's to answer prayer. So straight after that passage in Luke, in verse 9, he talks about the three actions that make up prayer and the way in which God answers. He says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. There we have it. Or which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? That comes from Matthew. What father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In Matthew it says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give good things to you? God wants to bless us. God wants to answer prayers. And he says this, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, it will be opened. The, the, the tense in the original uh, Greek text is we ask and keep on asking. We seek and keep on seeking. We knock and keep on knocking. In other words, the passage before with impudence, we keep, we ask and we keep on asking. With impudence, we seek and keep on seeking. With impudence, we knock and keep on knocking. You know, it seems like we're going overboard, but God says, don't. Keep praying. Keep at it. Build your faith up as you do that. Keep making yourself available to God. Show Him your heart in this. Speak to Him about it. He'll make the adjustments. He'll challenge us. But you're, we are guaranteed that if we ask, it, we will be answered. If we seek, we'll find. And if we knock, the door will be opened. God will help us through these processes. What are the reasons why we don't get answers? That's what we're going to look at now. Uh, 
Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Scripture teaches that God sometimes answers our prayers by allowing things to become much worse before they become better. And you think, well, I don't know if I agree with that. I know, often we say, you know, it's like the 11th hour, or it's 5 to 12, and then God will come through at the last. Well, what about Lazarus? Lazarus had already died. <laughs> Jesus was late. He was already dead and buried and stinking, the Bible tells us. Stinking. And so, for the purposes of God, he arrived at that time to show off his glory and his power, and through that many believed. So there's always a sovereign will and purpose of God that supersedes all of this. And often we are kind of demanding the answer now, and we keep praying, and we don't stop praying, like we were told. But eventually that was answered. Martin Lloyd-Jones also says, God sometimes gives unexpected answers to prayer. That's interesting. And I think of an example in Scripture, Solomon. You know, Solomon says, God says to him, ask anything. And he says, Lord, give me wisdom. I want to rule these people with wisdom. And God says, good, because you've asked for wisdom and not riches and not fame, I'm going to give you all of those. And so there's an unexpected answer to prayer. And so often it's, it's not just that we're not getting the answer we want. There's something unexpected that comes our way. And so... If we are promised answers to our prayer, our prayers, then the problem or breakdown isn't on God's side, but ours. So it's in our misunderstanding of how God answers prayer, or our lack of knowledge, or perhaps there's a heart condition that needs to be dealt with. We'll deal with that now. But yes, the scripture I wanted to read, James 4 verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So there is a way in which this ask, seek, and knock is short-circuited because of a heart condition. Therefore, part of answered prayer is God needing to make inward adjustments. So why doesn't God answer prayer sometimes? Because God has to first make some of these inward adjustments. Hypocrisy. Uh, the issue of hypocrisy in our lives. Uh, the issue of pride. I, I think of um, James and John, you know, they get their mom to go and ask Jesus prayer. You know, can one sit on one side and one on the other when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus just said, no, that's not for me to give. You know, you've misunderstood the whole point here. The heathen and the Pharisees, they all want, you know, superior positions. It's, for them, it's all about, uh, you know, these uh, issues of who's the greatest, but not with us. The servant is the greatest. Arrogance. Sometimes God can't answer that prayer because it's arrogant. You know, I want to be the best preacher. You know, often as I'm praying for revival, I want to be honest with you, I, I, I want to see revival take place in Joburg, but I want to be the preacher to preach the sermon on that day that the Spirit's poured out and it's cornerstone and everybody has to come and see it at cornerstone. That's pride. That's arrogance. God needs to deal with that first. So I don't get answered because of that. Or what about unforgiveness? Unforgiveness. I've got some kind of sin lodged in my heart. I'm not forgiving my brother. Actually, before I even bring any kind of worship before God, go and make a right with your brother. So unforgiveness needs to be dealt with. Sin needs to be dealt with. Lack of faith needs to be dealt with. Ungodliness needs to be dealt with. All of these issues. That's sometimes... Why God doesn't answer prayer. I'm not saying that it's because he's not answering that prayer of yours now because of these reasons. But it could be. You need to go and check this out with God. Second one. Often prayer is not answered because we pray what is contrary to God's word. We pray what is contrary to God's word. Yeah, some like ridiculous thing. You know, it's the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And, and, you know, um, man, I, I just want a lot of money, Lord. It'll never own me. Now, how do you know that? You know, we can't pray against what God's already said in his word. You know, it's like Jonah saying, I'm not going to go and preach to those Ninevites because they're going to turn and repent and they are enemies and I don't want them to repent. 
It's that attitude. If, if it's not in God's word, we can't pray it. It's important. And often the answer doesn't come because God is still waiting for us to follow through with obedience to what he has already said. So we've already gone to him. He's shown us what we need to do. And now our prayers are not answered. Well, God's waiting for us to follow through with the last thing. Well, Lord, I'm going to do this and do that. And then we come back to him and now we pray for more stuff. No, let's fulfill what he's called us to do. Often God doesn't answer our prayers because of timing. Timing. Many times the answer takes time. Something has to roll out first. Um, use me to save Joburg, Lord. That's a lifelong journey. Um, as is praying for a loved one. It could take 25 years. But we persist. We keep asking. We keep trusting God. We persevere in our prayer. We stubborn, audaciously so, with our prayers. Until we see those answers. Timing. Often we think it's the right time. But according to God's sovereign will, he's got the right time. Sometimes we won't even know. And it's not important that we know everything. We're not God. It's not up to us to know everything. It's up to us to have faith and to be obedient to what he's called us to do. Sometimes God doesn't answer prayer in this way. Are we sensitive enough to hear a no? Sometimes we're not hearing the no, and that is God answering the prayer. It's like this. Your son comes to you and he says, can I have a liter of petrol and a box of matches and he's seven years old of course here we go take the liter take the matches and go and blow yourself up sometimes the stuff we are praying god has to say no and you know often we can get caught up and i've heard it we pray these grand prayers and you know use me god and i want to go there and i want to give up my life and i'm going to do this and i'm going to do that a lot of that stuff we pray in is not god's will and he's saying no and he's saying no for a good reason. And it's important that we understand that. It is important that we understand this. Is it God's will for my life? Am I praying what is right? Is this the will of God for my life? Uh, often God's ideas of a good thing could be different to ours. So we pray, but God is saying that's actually not what I want for your life. Right? Another reason why God could have something better for us. Following on from the previous point, you think of the prodigal, he comes to the father and he says, after he's wandered and he comes back and he says, um, you know, even a servant is better off in my father's house. I'm not worthy to be called a son, he says to the father. I'm not worthy. God doesn't even answer him and just lavishes on him every benefit, every blessing that you would give to a son. Everything. Ring, sandals, robe, fattened calf. And so it's important to realize that God knows better. He knows better. He knows what's best for us. And then the last one is the answer hasn't come yet because God is wanting us to mature and develop perseverance. In other words, he's building spiritual muscle. And so often when we are asking and we are seeking and we are knocking, he keeps us at it because that's going to develop the faith and the muscle that's necessary to actually fulfill the thing that we're asking, fulfill the will of God that's, that he has for me. I want to read a passage of scripture to end with. I'm just going to go through a couple of the verses just to help us understand this issue is we win the battle in prayer. That's where we win the battle. You know, often we think we go and do, and then we pray afterwards. But we need to pray. We need to, we need to um, anticipate the circumstances that we're going to go through and pray. Before you make major decisions, pray. Before you choose a wife, a husband, pray. It's important. Before you take a job, even though there could be loads more uh, um, cash coming in, pray. Uh, you know, before you move house, pray. Well, before whatever it is we're going to do, we need to pray. And so the example I want to use is Jesus is about to face the cross. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. And this is how the story goes. In Matthew 26 verse 36. 
Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. In other words, prayer got to that point of agony. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. So what was happening is he was facing the challenge of the cross in prayer ready. God was enabling him to prepare himself for what was coming down the road. And going a little farther, that's verse 39, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That is the absolute climax of his time of prayer. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That is the purpose of prayer. Not what I want. What is it that you want? And so there's this challenge I'm going into. I'm going to plant a church. I'm going to get married. And, and so I know there's some of the hardships involved. I, I, you know, learning to love somebody else, learning not to just be an isolated individual and being generous and sacrificial with my love. Yeah, I don't want to make all those changes, but not what I want. It's what you want. Your word says it. I want to do it. You want it. And I want it for my life. Same as going to plant a church or, you know, whatever it, whatever the challenge is, there's, there's going to be difficulty. Christ is going to face the most challenging day anybody has had in history. The cross, suffering, the sin of the world. I, I would gladly have this pass. I would gladly not pay the price. But this is not about me, Lord. This is not about my personal preferences. You see, prayer is not about my comfort. It's not about what suits me. It's not about what makes me famous or, you know, makes me look good in the eyes of others. It's not how I can benefit. It's not my will, but it's yours. And so where do we win that battle? We win that battle in prayer. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping and their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed the third time. See the persistence? Saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and he said to them, See the breakthrough point. Sleep and take your rest later on. See the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. The breakthrough finally came. And so we see persistent prayer in the life of Jesus. Yes, the challenge to the disciples, verse 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. In other words, we need prayer. Because there's a frailty that we have within us due to the fall of man that we need to overcome. And it's through prayer as we swap our weakness with his strength. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And so where do I win that battle? In prayer. And so I overcome the weakness of the flesh. You see, I don't want to live crippled by sin all the time. I want to overcome. And it's overcoming prayer. Give me the strength. To make the right decisions. Give me the strength, Lord, to overcome the enemy. Give me the strength to do these things that you called me to. He answers those prayers. And so the answer comes. Christ has broken through in prayer. He's prayed until the answer has come. And now he's going to face that inevitable day. The day that he dies for the sin of the world. He's able to face it and he says very little. Because he'd said it all that night before as he prayed. And so I'm going to encourage us with our prayer. Joel calls the nation to pray. God answers their prayer. God is compassionate and he loves us. And he wants to have that conversation with us. And so I encourage you with this. Um, how is your prayer? Go for it. Just let our prayer lives just come alive with all of his goodness. And so, as I said right at the beginning of this preach,
please, if you'd like to receive Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, uh, you can do that now. You can pray. You can ask him. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him into your life. He will forgive you. Accept him as Lord and Savior. That's the most important thing you can do. Then get hold of us so that we can help you. We can show you the scriptures. We can follow up. And then if you need prayer for healing, you need us to help you, counsel you, talk to you, listen to your story, whatever it is, we'd love to do that. Love you guys. Let me pray with us. Father, thank you that you call us to pray and you answer us. And in answering us, you show us great and wonderful things that we don't know. And often in our hearts, there's an expectation that is far too little, that is far too small, that is far too inadequate, because there's so much more you want to show us, do with us, and there's so much more you want to change us into when it comes to the likeness of Christ. Pray your blessing over us, pray your protection in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi church family, we miss you all. We wanted to say hi and share a testimony of answered prayer. At the beginning of the week, President Donald Trump made an executive order to halt all immigration visas. Um, it turns out though, the day before, we have an announcement. Yeah! Yes! We got our visa! We got our visa the day before he made the executive order. So we're all really excited and we wish we could do this in front of you personally. Um, so we wait until we can all see each other again and that we all have huge hugs and great applause to our wonderful news. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for all your prayer. Thank you so much for keeping us in, in your prayers uh, throughout this whole journey. It has been a, uh, uh, it's almost, or June will be a year that we've been waiting, uh, but the time has come for us to do this as soon as the embassy opens up we're able to go process the visa and then as soon as the airports open up i don't know if that's level two or one or what level it is but as soon as flights are back up we'll be able to get on a flight and go we love you all i can't wait to see you all have a great week and we'll see you on wednesday for prayer cheers Bye. Bye.